Ever played with those invisible markers as a kid? You know, you draw on a piece of paper, but you don't see a darn thing until you take the black light over it, and then all of a sudden, all that information pops out at you? That's what a schematic is. Schematic has tons of hidden invisible information sitting right there that you don't see until you learn how to read them. It shows you the structure of circuits and how these circuits interact and play well for one another. So the secret to looking at a schematic through the proper lens is to think like electricity in a circuit. So that's what I'm gonna do in today's video. I'm gonna show you guys how to look at schematics through that lens so that we can start drawing out all that great invisible information that can literally transform your career. I'm Jersey Mike. Let's get into it. So as you can see here, we have a very simple circuit, right? We have our power source, which is the breaker. We have a wire carrying that power to a device that consumes it, which is the light bulb. And we have our neutral wire going back to the power source, uh, back to the breaker again, and that's a full complete circuit. And we have a switch in there that allows us to turn this circuit on and off. Now, I want you to think of the wires like a highway. I want you to think of the electricity as cars on the highway. And I want you to look at the switch like a drawbridge. Now, what happens when a big boat comes along and the drawbridge opens? It brings traffic to a stop, right? All the cars stop, traffic starts backing up, and on the other side of the drawbridge, the traffic keeps moving and the road is empty. This is how electricity flows through a circuit. So if our switch is open, we're gonna have electricity on that line all the way up to the switch where it's open, just like we're gonna have cars sitting on a highway when the drawbridge is open. So what did you just learn? What you just learned are three points you can use a multimeter to test for 120 volts and expect to see it there even though our light bulb is off. The point here is that when you can start looking at a schematic in that way, you can start making key decisions on diagnostics and find key points where you can start performing your tests. And the schematic tells you what results you should get when you're performing that test. So if you were to test for power at a key point here and you don't have it, now you're starting to identify a problem. You might have a trip breaker, for example. Now, another key takeaway that we learned here is that we noticed we had a light bulb with 120 volts going to it, but the light bulb wasn't turning on. The reason why is because you need more than just voltage to a component to actually make it run. You need flowing electricity. You need a current on a closed circuit for that to actually happen. And it's extremely common in HVAC to have situations where you will have 120 volts going up to motors and the motors will actually not be on. So let's take everything we just did and let's look at an actual schematic and look for the same thing. What we're looking at here is a schematic for an outdoor condensing unit on a split AC system. And we're going to kind of focus in on one little part of the schematic here. And we're going to replicate everything we just did on the light bulb diagram. Now take note of the dotted lines here. What dotted lines mean on a schematic is field wiring. When you pull a condensing unit out of a box, you don't have a disconnect in a whip hooked up to it. You have to install that yourself and that's what field wiring is. So that's what we're looking at here. These dotted lines is our whip coming from our disconnect box bringing power into the condensing unit. Now you'll notice down here we have L1 and L2. L is for line, that's your line voltage, right? So you have 120 volts on each one of these lines. So let's bring 120 volts on line one up into the unit and instead of a light bulb we come to a contactor. Now on a side note this is how I start when I look at any schematic. I always start with the power source coming in because this is a very easy way for you to orientate yourself. If you're standing in front of a condensing unit, it is extremely easy to see the disconnect whip coming into the condensing unit and locating the two wires that connect to the contactor. So you know exactly where you are on a schematic versus where you are on the actual unit. Now, as we follow this power up to the contactor, we see we come to an L1 terminal, right? So that's the screw terminal that our wire uh, gets tied down to. And if we look beyond that, we see a straight line that goes to the top of the contactor to another terminal, which is T1. So that's a terminal on the top side of the contactor where other wires are going to connect to. Now, you notice in between there's no switch, right? That's called a shunt. Um, it is not a switch. And because it's not a switch, our voltage is going to continue on beyond that. So we should have power at L1, we should have power at T1. And if we continue tracing this wire out, we can see it brings us all the way to the run winding on the compressor. 
So here we have a situation we spoke about earlier where we can have power up to a motor and the motor's not running because we do not yet have a complete circuit back to the power source. If we were to continue following this line, we can see it goes through our one winding, it goes onto our common winding, and we come to a switch here. That little symbol is a thermal overload. This is a temperature switch that's located inside the compressor. It's within the shell, you don't see it. Now this switch always remains closed. The only time this switch opens is when the compressor actually overheats um, and that prevents the compressor from continuously running and burning out. If you've ever seen a service tech with a garden hose running on the compressor itself, that's the situation he's dealing with. He's trying to cool it down so that switch can reclose again. But carrying on, we see as we trace the common line, we go all the way back to T2 on the top side of the contactor. And as we continue, what do we come to? We come to an open switch. We have an open drawbridge. And this is why our compressor is not running. Now, even though we have another line coming up, line two, to the bottom side of the contactor and the other side of that switch, the same principle still applies. We still need power going back to the source to complete for full circuit. So on a 240 volt circuit, the reason why you don't have a neutral is because each one of these wires switch back and forth 60 times every single second to act as the other wires neutral. But this happens so quickly that if you had your multimeter on either one of these legs, you're always going to read 120. And this is why we don't actually have a neutral wire in a 240 circuit because each of the wires take turns playing that role. Now before we move on, another great benefit to schematics is this. If you've ever been to say college or some kind of a training educational program they might give you an itinerary it's a list of classes that you have to take in a certain order so that you can graduate from the program a schematic plays that same exact role a schematic will provide you a structured lesson plan that will show you what you need to learn step by step so that when you go all the way to the end of the schematic you master the class this is an excellent approach to trying to learn and progress in your career because you're not learning willy-nilly something up here, then something over here, then something down here, and hopefully in a couple years it all comes together and the light bulb comes on. This is a very structured approach that helps you go through things step by step connecting the dots along the way. So going back to our schematic as an example, as we follow the power into the unit, what is the first thing we come to? It's a contactor. So our schematic is giving us our first class. It's telling us we need to learn about contactors and how they work. Pretty hard to diagnose systems if you don't know that. And as we follow the line, as we did before, we come to the compressor. And so that is our second class. We need to learn how a compressor works and all that. Now this might seem a little bit tedious if first going about it this way but I guarantee you as you start to gain knowledge you're going to start seeing the same things in other things you learn later on so for example once you learn how a compressor works, you're going to have the foundations you need to learn about condenser fan motors, for example. They both have run windings, they both have start windings, they both have common windings, and so forth. So now that we have a good idea on how to look at a schematic through the proper light and the proper lens, let's take a step back, look at a full schematic, and let's start identifying things we see right away with our eyes. Now one of the first things you might notice about the schematic is that there's more than one. But all you're really looking at are two different versions of the same exact thing. They're just showing it to you in a slightly different way. The diagram on the left is what we call a ladder diagram. And if you can see how it lays out, it almost looks like a ladder. The whole purpose of a ladder diagram is to kind of clean things up and give you a cleaner look at the circuit. So you can see we have one circuit on top, we have another circuit right below it. We don't have a whole bunch of overlapping lines, so it's a little bit less confusing. The schematic on the right, the full schematic, actually shows you the same circuits. It shows you the high voltage, the low voltage, and how they interact and play off of one another. So it's just two versions of the same thing. We can also look at all the lines here themselves. So we already talked about the dotted lines. We explained how that's field wiring not just high voltage whips but that's also thermostat wires that's field wiring as well these are the thermostat wires you connect up to the thermostat obviously uh, wiring and control boards and air handlers and furnaces and so on 
when we see thick black lines, what we're looking at are high voltage lines. This is the power we need to run the heavier pieces of equipment, compressors, fan motors, circulator pumps, and things of that nature. The thin black lines are what we call control voltage. This is usually 24 volts. And the reason why we call it control voltage is because we need some means to turn the high voltage circuits on and off so that we can control compressors and motors and pumps. So if we go back to our contactor as an example, we can see we have our high voltage flowing through there. We have an open switch or an open drawbridge, and we know this circuit has to be closed. That switch has to be closed in order for the circuit to be complete and the motors to actually run. And we do that with a low voltage signal. So when 24 volts hits that contactor, which comes ultimately from your thermostat, that 24 volts goes through a coil. The coil creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field pulls that switch closed on the high voltage line and we now have a complete circuit on our high voltage and our motor can run. Another facet of schematics is that you really want to get a command on switching. So especially in these control circuits, you're going to come across a lot of different types of switches and it's very important to understand the concept of what normally open and normally closed means. We need to know when these switches are opened and closed so that when we look at a schematic the way I've been showing you to look at it, we can actually understand where we have power and where we don't based on how these switches are positioned by default. So here we have typical switching symbols you're going to see very often on HVAC schematics. To the upper left here we have temperature switches showing the normally open and normally closed state. Uh, this is something you're going to see in the compressor, such as the thermal overload switch. Up to the right, we have an open and closed switch, like a light switch on our light bulb diagram. To the lower left here, we have pressure switches. You will find these on condensing units quite often. Um, and what these switches are is they monitor the pressure of the refrigerant in the system and they will open the 24 volt control circuit if the pressure is too high or too low. And this is to protect the compressor. Um, and then you have your relay symbols here, normally open and normally closed. So you can see the normally closed has a line through it. So when we go back to our schematic and we look at the switch on the contactor, we could see that it's a normally open switch. So something has to happen in order for it to actually close, which is the 24 volt signal of cooling that we get from our thermostat. Now, another place we want to focus in on are anywhere where lines intersect. Um, so on the schematic on the right, you will see that there's lines overlapping. Um, that does not indicate that those lines are connecting. So we don't have high and volt low voltage wires connecting to one another. In the latter diagram, you will see circles um, and these indicate actual connections. So whenever you have overlapping lines with nothing there, they do not connect. And whenever you have these circles, those are wires that actually do connect. Now you're also going to see what looks like arrows on schematics like we see right here. And these are not directional arrows. They're not telling you which way the electricity is flowing or anything like that. What these are are male and female connectors. So think Molex plugs, things of that nature. So going back to our schematic, we can see all these things. We see a normally open switch on our contactor. We see a thermal overload switch in our compressor which is normally closed. We see high and low pressure switches on our low voltage control circuit, which are also normally closed. We see male and female adapters connecting to one another. And we see intersections where wires are coming together where they are actually physically connecting and wires overlapping where they are not. Now I could sit here for another hour and take you through probably a thousand other symbols, but what I gave you guys today are the skills to get started, start going through these schematics, learning systematically, being able to recognize where you can develop test points for diagnosing, um, and hopefully all of this as it picks up rolling, you will advance your knowledge, uh, your skills in this career, and the money that follows with it. So if you found this helpful at all, follow the schematic all the way down to that like button, leave a comment, really helps get my channel out to other people who could use the information. Thanks for watching.